Good afternoon and um, friends, colleagues, old friends, new friends, collaborators, partners in crime that's going to change the world. <laughs> My name is Katja Iverson. I'm the president and CEO of an organization called Women Deliver. We're a global advocacy organization. And as you might hear on the name Women Deliver, we come from a background in maternal health. Today, we don't only care about maternal health because, as we say, women deliver and not only babies. So we uh, look at a, a much broader gender lens. And I am so pleased to be your moderator today. And thank you to the session organizers. It is so good to see this issue on the agenda. It's an important session. It is an important issue not just because women should not die giving life, but because this matters for everybody. It's a personal issue. Many of us know motherhood. Many of us have had sisters, aunts, daughters, maybe even ourselves who've had complications. We all came out of it right, but many <laughs> of our sisters did not. And Imagine if what would have happened if you had not, if we had not had the care that we needed when we were ready to deliver. Many, too many don't. Every two minutes a woman dies in childbirth, many more get injured. Um, she dies because she's too young, she dies because she's too poor, she dies because she lives too far from health care, she dies because there's a health system that was not ready to deliver when she was ready to deliver. <coughs> and the vast majority of those deaths are preventable. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. We are gonna look at the situation in the world regarding maternal health and maternal mortality with a specific but not only focus on Europe. And we're gonna look at what can be done because we do know the problems. So this is about solutions and it's about you because you are people in power who can change what the world looks like. We will look at the past work of uh, WPL high-level events that took pl place in Malta uh, in March and in the European Parliament in Brussels in June. And we'll inform and engage and mobilize new people who, who want to work on this. We'll hear from some very esteemed speakers and we will get you all involved in some discussions. There's been a lot of listening today. So to be, they, to, right now it's also about your ideas and your discussions and use. And then we'll wrap up with a panel where we are really looking at action and the way forward. We will first hear from a very impressive woman. Uh, allow me to take a moment to welcome and introduce the esteemed president of Malta, Her Excellency, Marie Louise Corriero Preca. She was the youngest and second woman to become president of Malta. And before that, she had a glorious career of many firsts. She is a true groundbreaker, and she fights for what's right. For women, for, well, for women and for all, for well-being in society, health, social inclusion, benefits, and stepping up against sexual violence and assault. And yes, maternal health. President is active member of the Council of Women, World Women Leaders and a strong member of the advisory board of Women Political Leaders Global Forum. And she is the one who's been spearheading their work on maternal health. She truly is a woman who delivers. <laughs> Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. You make me shy. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here and making this discussion worthwhile. And I do hope it will be very, very worthwhile at the end of it, because we will be committing ourselves to doing something. Otherwise, it would be like a talk shop. Let's not make this summit a talk shop, but uh, a place where we show ourselves to be doers and commit ourselves to doing more and more and more. Well, I'd like to thank um, WPL for bringing this topic to also to the summit and MSD for Mothers who have been partnering with WPL from the very start. Yes, we started in March in Malta where we had this distinguished really gathering of, of women in, in Malta where we tr took the opportunity to uh, organize this conference which was facilitated 
uh, well, WPL, MSD formalism, facilitation through my, through my office. We took the opportunity while Malta was um, presiding the uh, Council of the European Union and it was in parallel to the informal meeting of the, minister, the Ministers for Health. It was purposely done during those days so that we can bring over the uh, Commissioner um, for Health, European Co uh, Union Commissioner, and also the Minister for Health, Maltese Minister for Health, was presiding the, the, uh, the meeting. So yes, we had a very important conference with a number of recommendations, which I hope we'll get into detail as we go along uh, during the discussion. Um, at the end, these, the, these recommendations we presented to the um, Commissioner, European Commissioner for Health, who has promised, promised that he will keep visible this issue of maternal health. One of the things which have always, which surprised me and they shock me, that even in the European Union we have one in ten mothers who, um, potential mothers, who do not have access to maternal health during their, their first weeks um, of, of pregnancy. It is shocking to me because we are supposed to be uh, the promoters of health systems, of welfare systems, etc. And to find that still we are missing out on a number of potential mothers um, due to ex uh, lack of accessibility to healthcare, to healthcare uh, during well maternal healthcare is something to me that is extremely shocking. And I must thank again. MSD for mothers for taking on board this idea of mapping out the, the services that are being given in Europe so that we will know exactly where the problem lies because um, indicators are very important to give us uh, uh, a picture, an, indicate, an indication, but we need to spot out where the grey areas are so that we can lobby for action to be taken. So I really must thank again Marianne, MSD for Mothers, for being there to take on board this, this research. Um, and it, really, this is a huge uh, um, CSR from your part, but also a sense of unlimited commitment towards the cause. We are in a, in a situation where the, uh, the issue of maternal health is becoming even more and more alarming because we know that like 244, 244 million people are migrating. That is the amount that are being given of migrants today. Half of those are women. 19.6 are million are refugees. Half of those are women. So the potential of pregnancy, the potential of motherhood is huge. So the issue of maternal health for people on the move, it is even further compounded due to their vulnerability, their people on the move. Then I think I would be missing out on my conscience if I do not speak of Africa. I speak of Africa as maybe the nearest continent to, to, to Europe. And I, I feel a sense of responsibility, your our interconnectedness, which does not come with the migration issue. It comes through our shared history as two continents and Malta being in the middle of the Mediterranean. So we have more visibility of that continent. But let me tell you how, how the situation also to, to, uh, in terms of what you, uh, African countries can spend on healthcare. Um, a, few, a few days ago, 20th November to be precise, it was Africa Industrialization Day, and I was invited in Brussels to speak on this, on, on this day. And I had the opportunity to go through some studies, uh, and one of these studies gives out such, such an insight on certain situations. It is the honest report accounts report, honest accounts report, which, is, which, is, which has been conducted by a coalition of UK and uh, African NGOs. And they, they, one of the things which, are, which to me is so glaring in the face of certain situations in Africa, in Africa is about the money that goes into Africa. And this report says 
$162 billion go into Africa in terms of aid, in terms of investment, etc. But then $203 billion come out of Africa in terms of um, tax dodging, multinationals, etc. So Africa, from the African continent, more wealth is coming out rather than getting into Africa. So like 40, 41 billion dollars uh, comes out of Africa in the pockets of, well, various, various uh, entities, one could say. Imagine with, the, with that 41 billion dollars what a lot could be done in the health sector in Africa. But due to this differences, this difference, we know that there are countries who lack the basic um, health, health systems, moreover maternal health. So I, I, I just mentioned Africa. There are other impoverished regions in the world which we need to think of. So, I mean, I spoke of an, afflu an affluent region, which is the European Union, but then, and there again, we have flaws, even more so in countries who are impoverished um, and, and need the support, need genuine interest, need genuine investment, need sustainable investment in, in, in first of all in the dignity of the people of Africa, but then sustainable investment so that they can grow and prosper. Well, I think I should s stop here because I, I, I thought I, I will not take uh, my, my contribution at length, but I think I did. I'm sorry about this. Well. You have absolutely nothing to be sorry about. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and also thank you for drawing the attention to the disparity and the inequalities uh, surrounding the issue. And also this is not just a women's issue. This is a societal, economic, and really big issue. Um, don't put it in that sometimes diminishing women's box. But I would like to move on to a beautiful panel, beautiful list of esteemed speakers, and I'll just do a very brief introduction and I'll say a little more when they get ready to speak. First and not least, we have Marianne Echebet from Merck for Mothers, one of the reasons we're here today, Executive Director of Merck for Mothers. We have Xavier Platmonet, Director General of the Directorate General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. And uh, Caroline Hickson, Regional Director for uh, Euro IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, European Network. Uh, and I'd like to start with you, Marianne. Thank you. We, we decided that we're on first names. Yes. <laughs> this, you know, when, we, when we know each other well, it's difficult not to. So, uh, and just before I want to, I, I, I say, you know, you can also let other people know about this. We have two okay. wonderful hashtags. WPL Summit and End Maternal Mortality. And I'll make it easy for you, so I have the first tweet for you, if you're one of the <laughs> tweeters. No woman should die giving life. Yeah. Hashtag WPL Summit steps it up for girls and women end maternal mortality. Yes, thank you, Katya. And that, Marianne, <laughs> you are a powerhouse. You are responsible for a very successful implementation of a robust set, a fantastic <laughs> program called Merck for Mothers. Yes. Uh, that, you know, has really shown that private sector steps it up yeah. and uh, takes responsibility. And we deliver. And you deliver. We deliver. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you have, you have such great degree, but all the bios are on your tables. So I will not go through yeah. education degrees and all of that. Please. Just say that here we have yet another yeah. woman who delivers. Thank, thank you so much, Katya. And thank you all of us uh, for participating uh, in this session today. Um, I want to take us uh, right into a short video where really speaks to why we're here, and then we'll start the conversation. So.
for some who take their lives. But thousands of health facilities are saying push. Our health workers say push. Our worldwide partners say push. Let's push until all maternal mortality is in the past. So, no, I, that, that is a very powerful film. And I think we realize, uh, all of us sitting here, uh, that we can change that story. That doesn't have to be uh, the end of the story uh, for 800 women every day. And we've already heard, you know, from some of the panelists, from Katya, from Her Excellency, that maternal mortality happens everywhere in the world. Okay? It may strike at the vulnerable and at the poor more often, but even in countries that are rich, that are developed, we still see it happening. Disparities exist. I right now live in the United States of America, in New York. And in New York, black women are 12 times more likely to die in pregnancy or childbirth than white women. I, I see in the audience here folks from around the world, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to at least identify you know, where you're from. So anyone from Africa? I'm also going to claim Africa. I was born in Nigeria. Anyone uh, from Asia? Anyone from, from the Middle East? Also, <laughs> you, you, you span, span continents. Anyone uh, from North America? And anyone from South America or Latin America? So I think we all know from Romania. From, from, from Romania. And so, you know, I think we're all here because we know that it's an issue uh, in the countries uh, that we're coming from. Uh, and that uh, we are not only talking about disparities between countries, but we must also talk about disparities within countries. And my co-panelist, uh, Xavier Pratsmonet, will also speak more specifically uh, to what's happening in Europe. Uh, so I'll, I'll let him do that. Uh, but what I'd like to bring to this, this, this group, this workshop, uh, is how MSD for Mothers as a private sector partner uh, can work with you government legislators, parliamentarians, work with NGOs uh, to solve for this issue. We know what to do. Uh, the two key things uh, to save mothers in pregnancy and childbirth are one, improving the quality of care, improving the quality of maternal health care. And then the second key thing is improving access to modern contraception. I also want to ask a question to the audience. So if we got every girl and woman access to high quality modern contraception in the world today, how much would we reduce the maternal mortality rates? I, I hear a half. I'm going to ask any other options. Yes? Half? Half? I hear 40% 40, 40 here. Any, any other? 60? So all of you definitely believe in the power of contraception, <laughs> which, which, is, which is a good thing. I think that the, the figure is closer to 30%, but that, that's an amazing solution you know, that we have that can solve, help to solve maternal mortality, that we need to figure out how to make sure that that reaches more women in all of our communities. I want to share a little bit about what MSD for Mothers does. Uh, since we started in 2011, uh, we have reached over 6.6 .6 million women, uh, improving their access to quality medical, uh, maternity care and improving their access to modern contraception. But as Katya said, it, we don't just stop there. This is not just a woman's issue. Uh, by investing in maternal health care, we're also strengthening health systems that support and uplift the communities in which women live in. And we're also strengthening and the world. Okay? The, these are the foundations uh, for development, growth. I was on a panel earlier about peace. Uh, it's the foundation for peace and prosperity. We know that when we save a mother's lives,
a life. Uh, her children are 10 times more likely to finish school. Uh, they're also uh, 10 times more likely to have a higher life expectancy. Uh, when women have access to modern contraception and can have safe uh, deliveries, uh, they are 84 times, uh, sorry, uh, 80, they are able to attend school 84% uh, more likely. Uh, we also are able to increase their economic productivity and their wages by 25%. And that, in turn, increases uh, per capita income of nations by up to 65%. So th this, this is not just an investment in women. It's an investment in the world that we want to live in in the future. I want to also bring it back down to the personal level. This is Noor. Uh, she's one of the women uh, that journalists from the Time magazine followed for a year. Uh, one of three women who gave birth um, fleeing Syria. So she gave birth uh, to, her daughter, uh, uh, to her daughter in Greece uh, as, as a refugee. And what she wants for her daughter, her daughter's name is Helen, uh, is for her to be able uh, to grow up uh, in a society and in a community uh, where she has access uh, to all opportunities. And it's only by making sure we take care of Noor uh, that we can make sure that Helen and Helen's siblings uh, are also able to become uh, contributing uh, members uh, of society. And so how do we make sure that that happens, especially for women uh, who are, as I like to say, between worlds and in uh, communities that may not be their home? Uh, we need to make sure that we break down those key barriers uh, to accessing maternal care, whether they be cultural, language, beliefs, religion, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, uh, the political climate, uh, resources all of these barriers that you know very well, but we also know, as I said, how to solve for them. And some of the ways that our partners, uh, the MSD for Mothers partners, uh, are solving for them are really effective, impactful, and innovative ways. Uh, so in Greece, uh, we're working with Medicine du Monde, also known as Doctors of the World, to make sure that women in refugee camps have access uh, to maternity care and family planning services. Uh, we're working with an organization in Germany that has a program called Mimi uh, that makes sure that new refugees and migrant populations have access to culturally appropriate uh, language, uh, appropriate services so that they can access the care that they need. And in Romania, we're working with World Vision, again, uh, to integrate quality maternity care services uh, with local uh, institutions, again, all to increase access. We don't want to stop there, though, because what we've realized is that by just supporting programmatic uh, delivery, um, that's not always sustainable. And so that, that's why we're here. That's why we've partnered with Her Excellency and the WPL, uh, because it's the legislators that are actually going to be able to implement policies that will sustain these changes uh, and uh, have uh, long-standing changes, uh, sorry, long-standing impact from others. Um, so we'll hear more uh, about the Malta outcome declaration. I think Her Excellency has already mentioned uh, some of it. But what, what I'd like uh, to leave all of you with is that we know what to do. We know how to do it but we need to make sure that these interventions are integrated into the fabric of society and that they're institutionalized in policies and we need your help as legislators uh, to do that. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, Marianne. Very inspiring and thank you for uh, drawing our attention to the very important solutions and, and also knowing that solutions can come from from many different places. It is, it is not a given. MSD for Mothers' work is very inspiring. And thank you for making us cry. I don't know about you, but I totally choked up and I've even seen the film before, but it's, it's really important. This is what it's about. So, uh, so thank you for that, not for the crying, but for the, for the story. Next, we have um, 
we have Xavier uh, Prats Bonet, and, and I'm not going to say anything about women who deliver, but I'm going to say that there's a lot of good men who deliver for women, and thank you for that, because if, when we really want to solve it, it takes all of us. So I look forward to hearing about the EU Commission's commitment to eliminating uh, maternal mortality and, and improving the access to maternal health care in the European uh, Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katya. You know, when you speak in a conference organized by women to an audience of women about motherhood, and you're a man, the risk of mansplaining is very, very high. <laughs> I, I, I take that as an invitation to brevity, but I hope as it's been said that you will agree that you don't need to be a woman to be moved by what we've seen. Uh, and because this is really an issue for society, not for women. It is. It is an issue of human rights, but it's in the interest of society. So, I don't have personal stories to tell you that would be as convincing as this ones. but therefore let me just say a few words from the policy wonk side about maternity. And in particular, ma maternal mortality ratios, which is a very interesting indicator. It's not by chance that it is used in the, in the Sustainable Development Goals as the indicator for maternal health care because it is a simplistic but very effective proxy that tells you how efficient a healthcare system is and more importantly, how sensitive a society is to the needs of its women. And if you look at where we stand on maternal mortality ratios, actually, it's pretty staggering. This is, these are figures for different parts of the world and I'm sure you can guess which parts. This, let me tell you first what is this ratio for those of you who are maybe not specialists. This ratio measures this is a number. Uh, it's a number that measures how many women between the age of 15 and 49 die either during pregnancy or in the six weeks after childbirth, excluding those women who die of HIV AIDS, which is another drama, not for today. That is the ratio. And if you look at this, is the distribution. In the EU, the average is eight, and I'll say a few words more about that. Uh, the world average is 216 over 100,000 and in low-income uh, countries it's almost 500. Now that tells you already the difference we have between countries. But what is even more interesting is that all this is unnecessary. And let me give you the example of the, within Europe. Look at this graph. This gives you the difference in performance between EU countries. So the good news is that this is very low. Even Romania at 31, madam, sorry, at 31 is very high. But even that is good news. Romania was 25 years ago in 1990, Romania was at 124. So there's been a, a, a huge progress, huge progress. But the, the story is still there, that there's a difference of one to 10 within Europe in this ratio. And in this group, actually, this is the punishment to Iceland for not being in the EU. <laughs> if it had been in the EU, you would see that it's also at three, uh, down from just seven 25 years ago. And you have Germany, Italy, my country, Spain, Austria, many others that are very low, 4%, all, all of these. Huh? So overall it's good news, but significant differences. And look at this, there is, is there a link between mortality and money? Well, this tells you that actually no. Poland is at three out from 17, 25 years ago, and Poland spends less than a thousand euro per capita per year on healthcare, whereas Luxembourg spends almost 10 times as much, and it has a worse performance. So it's not, or at least it's not just about money. All this actually could be avoided. And as a matter of fact, if I may very modestly try to think about what would be an issue where WPL, women political leaders, could actually commit not just because it's an important issue, but because it is avoidable and because it's actually not expensive. I'm sure we'll hear how much it would cost to give free access to contraception to everybody, every single woman in the world. It would be expensive, but not that expensive, about five billion euro. That's about a third of what an aircraft career costs. Can we afford it? Yes. Are we not doing it? Why? Because there's not enough political will. It's the only simple reason. 
What is it to be a vulnerable woman in the EU? Well, we know this from the Malta Declaration. I won't be long, but let me just say a few key things. The first is that vulnerable women, particularly but not only refugees, I say not only because in Europe we have also Roma citizens, for example, and people who have a very low income, who are just as discriminated as others, uh, most of these people actually don't have legal access. That is why, by the way, at the EU we have proposed changing legislation to give refugees the same access to healthcare, including maternity healthcare, as other citizens. So there's a legal impediment, but more importantly, there is a cultural impediment. If you are an immigrant woman and you don't speak the language of the country you find yourself in, it's very difficult to have access. And if you do not have the literacy, in literal terms, but also the health literacy, to know what you should do, then you maybe don't do it. And if you don't know how to navigate the maze of bureaucracy, then it's even more difficult. And if you don't have enough data in the country about what happens with refugee and migrant and vulnerable women, then it is even more difficult because you're not counted, and if you're not counted, you don't exist. These things are complicated, but they are within our reach. It's just that we need to be committed to that. I won't give you the propaganda thing about what the EU is doing, but let me give an example of the instruments we already have. We have two big programs that you see here, an action plan and then a fund for integration of asylum people, which are not specifically for mothers, not for refugees, but they can also be for that. Actually, for example, Spain, my country, is already using this 7.1 billion euro fund for that. So we have general instruments where motherhood has a role, and then we have specific projects, many of them thanks to the European Parliament. Here you have two examples that are actually quite interesting. One of them, the first one, uh, Oramia, Orama, you can look it up, it's interesting. It's, it's done to address the cultural challenges of immigrant women, but this is a drop in the sea. I think it's the right drop, but it's still a drop. So, could we do more? I think we could do more, and it's all about eliminating the structural barriers to, of access to healthcare. This is an awful way of saying that we have administrative, bureaucratic, unnecessary impediments for better access. This means, to a great extent, to make sure that sectors work together. It is extraordinary how difficult it is for a Ministry of Health to work together for a, to, with the Ministry of Interior. It's not the same language. It's not the same concerns, not the same incentives. They don't get the same positive feedback. Therefore, they don't work together. But this also can be overcome. But then you have also training for healthcare professionals, which is the link between education and healthcare. Before working on healthcare, just two years ago, I was in education. And I can tell you, for me, it's so obvious that education and health go together because it's only through health literacy that you make progress also in this area. So it's there. And my last words would be an encouragement, modestly, an encouragement to say that if the women political leaders, way above the level of influence that I could ever have, want to focus on one credible, strong area where you can show immediate progress, well, this is one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xavier, and, and you know, as Desmond Tutu said, the wave of change is made by drops, and we all drops in that change. Thanks a lot for, uh, um, yeah, there are so many things you highlighted, but the integration part, uh, this is not, if you only treat this as a health issue, we're not going to solve it. It's finance, it's planning, it's education, it's uh, infrastructure, and we need to collaborate across sectors and across issues to solve it. Caroline, you know you could have been my boss if I had stayed in the Danish Family Planning Association, but you're not. It would have been fun though, it would have been fun. So Caroline works for International Planned Parenthood a European Network and is doing an amazing job there. And uh, you'll be talking about the facts on uh, on maternal health in Europe and what, what, what's happening, uh, in addition to what Xavier did, and who's falling through the cracks? How is it that we prevent it, and what policies do we need to tackle? Okay, thank you, Katia, and thank you to my fellow panel members. Um, the title of our session is about borders, and of course, when you think about um, maternal health care in Europe in recent times, and you think of borders, what do you think, what comes to your mind is those pictures of heavily pregnant women or women carrying newborns walking 
walking across border after border, trying to find sanctuary from war and destitution and persecution. And we cannot talk about maternal health in Europe without talking about refugees and migrants. But before I do that, I'd like, to, I'd like you con to consider a different kind of border. So my question to you is, can we put a border within the time span of the life of a woman on maternal health. Of course we know that we must take care of women during pregnancy, during the postpartum phase, but is it enough to start at the beginning of pregnancy and end at the end of breastfeeding? Of course not. The WHO states that reproductive health addresses the reproductive process, functions and systems at all stages of life. This is a WHO, what they call the life course uh, approach to health. And this focuses on a healthy start to life and targets the needs of people at critical stages of their life to, throughout their whole life. And it addresses, therefore, the causes, not the consequences of ill health. In this case, maternal health. And if we start looking at the lifelong uh, causes of poor maternal health, that significantly extends our boundaries of what is required to ensure the health and well-being of mothers and children. And Marianne already referred to the uh, vital uh, importance of contraception. Because maternal health is part of the continuum of a woman's sexual and reproductive health throughout her life. And in order to assure this aspect, women must be able to exercise multiple rights to education, to information, to non-discrimination, to freedom from torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. So, women's health and maternal health is inextricably interlinked with gender equality, which is the key topic of this conference. So I'd like you to keep those interconnected strands in mind as we dive a little deeper into the maternal health landscape in Europe a lifelong approach and a rights-based approach, firmly based in gender equality, is essential for good maternal health. We've heard a little bit uh, from Xavier about the um, landscape of a maternal health in Europe. Um, we do have good news. Between 2009 and 2015, the maternal mortality rate decreased by, only, by almost half within the wider European region, as defined by WHO Europe. Um, but we have heard about the inequality between countries in Europe. But this is not the only inequality. Possibly the far larger inequality lies within countries. The UK Confidential Report on Maternal Deaths provides a snapshot of women who died in childbirth between 2009 and 2013. They were women from the most deprived areas, women where both partners were unemployed, vulnerable women with drug dependency. So very similar to the situation in the United States. It's inequality. And women from minority ethnic groups were at particular risk. In fact, women from an Indian background were two and a half times more likely to die than a woman of British descent. This chimes with the WHO Europe statistics that women with non-Western origin are at a 60% higher rate of maternal mortality. So this already enormous inequality has been compounded by the vast movement of refugees and migrants into and across Europe that we've heard about. Last year, I visited Médecins du Monde in Greece with MSD for mothers. And while I was there, I saw the incredible volunteer effort, literally thousands of medical practitioners giving their time for free to meet the desperate needs of women who arrived or were in transit. They told us stories like that of Rana, who was a Syrian refugee who gave birth uh, in a refugee camp in Attica in Greece. She got no uh, antenatal care and she got no care after the birth of her baby. And she ended up sleeping rough on a bench with her children and her newborn in Athens. Fortunately, she was one of the women that Médecin du Monde uh, came across. Volunteers helped her, gave her and her children support, and she was one of the lucky ones who was eventually enabled to move on and join her husband in Germany. But Rana's just one case in thousands. 
In October, Médecins du Monde released research based on the experience of 14,000 refugee women, which showed almost half received no access to antenatal care, and up to 72% were treated inadequately. We can't treat mothers like this. It's just not acceptable in Europe in the 21st century. Reproductive health cannot be an afterthought for refugees and migrants. An essential package of care must be included for refugees and in all crisis situations. But <laughs> But our deficiencies in maternal health care are not restricted to refugees and migrants. IPPF's member associations across Europe work with their country's most marginalized communities. And we've already heard that one of those most marginalized communities are the Roma. Um, the Roma number about 10 to 12 million people spread across Europe. Roma women have less access to contraception, they have more teenage pregnancies, uh, higher birth rates, more unsafe abortions, and they face multiple barriers accessing healthcare services. In France, 9 out of 10 women have no access to maternal health care. But even worse, when they do access maternal health care, discrimination is rife with denial of care, lower quality of care, breaches of confidentiality, and regular humiliation. I give you the words of Viola from Slovakia. Giving birth to your first child is the worst, probably because you are a first-time mother and you don't know anything. And so they call you nasty names. They say, well, you had sex to make this child, so now you have to deliver it. They said, you gypsies are just trash. My labor was two days and I asked for something to help with the pain. They said no. They told me a first-time mother needs to experience the pain. But I saw them give pain relief to a first-time mother who was white. If we want to improve maternal health in Europe, we must tackle the deep-seated discrimination towards the Roma and other ethnic minority groups. The IPPF member program in Macedonia takes a holistic approach working with service providers and carrying out advocacy campaigns, but at its heart is empowerment and participation of the women themselves. And this is so vital. I attended a roundtable uh, launch of the second confidential report into maternal deaths in Kyrgyzstan just about a month ago. And what struck me most was the absolute tragedy that one of the main reasons for women dying in childbirth was that they weren't able to recognize the symptoms of when things were starting to go wrong in their pregnancy. So therefore, they didn't get the timely help they needed. And as Marianne referred to, most of their deaths were preventable simply because they didn't have the knowledge. And so they died. And they leave husbands, children, and loved ones behind them. It's not just the woman. How different the experience of informed women who know their rights. It was terrific to see um, Lydia Rokova up on the podium today uh, representing uh, Romani women in uh, the, the EU Parliament. And I have a quote from a Roma woman in Macedonia. My gynecologist at first asked me for money. People are often asked for bribes. But I told him that I know if a woman is pregnant, she shouldn't pay for checkups, and that I could sue. So I didn't pay the money, he asked, because I knew I didn't have to. As Petra de Sutter, one of Belgium's leading gynaecologists and Council of Europe Assembly member, recently said, it is ignorance which is most damaging for maternal health in Europe. Ignorance and ideological barriers. And those are ideological barriers which, due to the current political climate, are increasing. And it's something we have to counter and we have to fight if we want to save women's lives. <coughs> and they are things which can be overcome. They must be overcome. And the best place to start is with young people. Girls and boys must be equipped with the levels of physical, emotional and sexual literacy they need to manage their own health, to safely engage in intimate relationships, and to have the freedom to decide if and when they want to have children. But we know from our experience that much of Europe's youth still lacks such skills and knowledge. 
This means we're failing our young people. We are endangering them just at the time of their lives when we should nurture them. And we see the results in high teenage pregnancy rates, in sexually transmitted diseases, and all too evident in recent months in endemic sexual harassment and gender-based violence. All of these things have an impact on maternal health. In summary, we're not doing a good enough job on maternal health in Europe. Too many countries are not living up to their commitments to women and children. IPPF would echo the call of the Malta Declaration to make the health of every mother and child, regardless of nationality, ethnicity or administrative status, a political priority in the EU and the Council of Europe. We strongly support the principles and recommendations of the WHO Europe Action Plan on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, in particular, as I said earlier, the importance of a rights-based and lifelong approach to maternal health embedded in gender equality. We must start by ensuring all young people have the skill sets and knowledge to empower and protect them. And we must redouble our efforts to ensure that in Europe, right now, no mother is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you for giving us the stark realities. You know, and thank you for the wonderful job you and the network of family planning associations across not only Europe, but across the world, the world is doing. That, the life course approach is extremely important. It is extremely important to keep the realities in mind, but also thank you at the end for outlining some of the solutions.